Hello and welcome to Asia Newsweek. I'm Yvonne Yong. Together we'll go through the top stories in the region and go beyond the headlines for a deeper look at Asia. Our top story, diplomatic ties between India and Canada have sunk to a new low after the countries each expelled several top diplomats in retaliatory moves. India's High Commissioner to Canada is among those being forced out after police allege they uncovered evidence of a targeted campaign against Canadian citizens by agents of the Indian government. Shortly afterwards, India moved to expel six Canadian diplomats, including the acting High Commissioner and their deputy. For more on this, South Asia correspondent Ellie Grounds joins us from New Delhi. Ellie, how did this diplomatic row begin? Why did it escalate this week? Well, Yvonne, this all started back in June last year when an Indian-born Canadian citizen, Hardeep Singh Nijar, was killed in Vancouver. He was shot in his truck outside his temple. Now, Mr Nijar, uh, a Canadian citizen, lived in Canada, but a member of this separatist movement that wants to create an independent Sikh homeland independent of India called Khalistan. Now, that movement is largely med led by members of the Sikh diaspora overseas. And a couple of months after that, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau came out and publicly said that there were credible reasons to believe that uh, agents of the Indian government were involved in that murder. Obviously, that angered uh, New Delhi. New Delhi came out and said those allegations were not credible. Now, fast forward to now, and uh, this week we've seen fiery statements from both sides. It all started when we had a statement from India's uh, Ministry of External Affairs come out and say that they had been told by Canada that their top diplomats, including their High Commissioner, were being named as persons of interest in this murder investigation. India says those allegations were concocted. And in this statement, which was quite fiery, um, personally accused Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of long-standing hostility towards India and his government of sheltering what they say are terrorists and extremists. Because Mr Nijar, although you know people who support the Palestine movement would have said that perhaps he's a peaceful activist, uh, in India he was designated as a terrorist back in 2020. So India sees that movement as extremist. We had statements fly back and forth and eventually ended up with both countries expelling six diplomats, including each other's high commissioners. So an extraordinary breakdown of diplomatic ties between India and Canada. After those expulsions were announced, we then heard from Canada. The Canadian police came out and, you know, they said, we wouldn't usually announce these things publicly, but this is such a big deal. We're going to tell you about this investigation. And we now have credible evidence that uh, governments of the Indian, uh, so, sorry, agents of the Indian government are involved in violent crimes on Canadian soil, including homicides. And again, we had uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau come out and reiterate those claims as well and say that, you know, in his words, India had made a big mistake uh, in perpetrating what he says were crimes on Canadian citizens on Canadian soil. Ellie Grounds, thank you. No worries. Thanks, Yvonne. To some headlines now, a Bangladesh court has issued an arrest warrant for former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina for crimes against humanity. It's been at least two months since she fled to India after deadly protests broke out in Bangladesh. Hundreds of TikTok employees in Malaysia have been laid off as the social media company moves to increase the use of artificial intelligence to moderate its content. Currently, TikTok employs a mix of automated detection and human moderators to review content posted on the site. Well, the job cuts come as global technology firms in Malaysia face greater government regulatory pressure. Indian police are investigating the motive behind the killing of prominent politician Baba Siddiq, who was shot dead in Mumbai. The 66-year-old was killed near the office of his son, who is also a politician. Two people have been arrested in connection with the killing. Mr Siddiq was an influential figure in Maharashtra state, which is due to hold elections next month. The killing has sent shockwaves throughout the community. Well, it's terribly worrying. Um, I know that it has sent a chill down the spines of everybody who lives in this city because Mumbai is the financial capital. It's, um, you know, second most important city in the country, arguably. Um, it's also a, a city that boasts of having a very strong and efficient and effective police force. 
And here we have, uh, you know, a prominent, extremely influential individual uh, who already had police protection because he had already received threats to his life. And in spite of being protected by the police and having a protection detail around him, he was gunned down in his car. Um, and this has been extremely upsetting because now people are questioning law and order all over the city and the state. Taiwan recorded the most aircraft around the island in a single day as Beijing conducted large-scale military drills on Monday. Communist China claims the democratically governed island as its territory. The exercises occurred just days after Taiwan's president gave his first National Day speech. East Asia correspondent Kathleen Calderwood followed this report from Taipei. These drills are the second in a series. In May, Beijing launched military exercises around Taiwan in the days following the inauguration of the President Lai Qingda. They were called Joint Sword 2024A and were characterised as punishment exercises. Now, the drills that we've seen this week are called Joint Sword 2024B and they've been described as a stern warning to Taiwan independence forces by the spokesperson from the People's Liberation Army. Now, the exercises involved all arms of the Chinese military, the Navy, Air Force, Army and Missile Force and they were described as an exercise surrounding Taiwan and simulating a blockade of key ports and areas. Now they were expected to a degree and they come only days after the president gave his first National Day speech in which he said that China and Taiwan were not subordinate to each other. He said that Beijing has no right to represent Taiwan but he also expressed a desire for China and Taiwan to cooperate more particularly in the areas of climate change, preventing infectious diseases and of course regional security. The president held out an olive branch in his keynote speech, which was highly praised by the international community. But China ignored the message and continued to threaten Taiwan with military actions. Taiwan independence is incompatible with peace in the Taiwan Strait, and the provocations of the Taiwan independence forces will inevitably be countered. So how worried about these exercises should people really be? Look, there's certainly no reason to panic. As you can see, life here in Taiwan has continued on as normal. And as I mentioned, these exercises were somewhat expected. But it's worth noting that these are part of an overall trend from Beijing, a campaign of trying to normalise this sort of behaviour. There has been a clear trend in the past two years since the Nancy Pelosi visit, which saw Beijing launch missiles over Taiwan of this increasing military activity around Taiwan, uh, not only by number, but certainly by area as well. And while there's certainly no evidence of any kind of plans for an immediate uh, invasion or blockade, it is part of a broader campaign to desensitise not only the Taiwanese public, but even the global community to this kind of behaviour, particularly at a time where there is so much other conflict going on around the world. North Korean state media says 1.4 million young people have applied to join the army this week. The fiery rhetoric comes amid ongoing tensions with the South. On Tuesday, North Korea blew up sections of unused road and rail routes that once linked the two countries. South Korea's military filmed a number of detonations, along with North Korean trucks and excavators clearing away debris. The demolitions come days after Pyongyang accused Seoul of sending drones over the capital and scattering anti-North leaflets. Meanwhile, thousands of North Korean troops are reportedly being trained in Russia to help Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. As regional instability intensifies, many in South Korea are worried how the next U.S. president will respond. North Asia correspondent James Oten reports. It's long been known North Korea is supplying Russia with ammunition, artillery shells to help fuel its invasion of Ukraine. But now, four months since the two nations entered a new military alliance, it now seems North Korea is also supplying thousands of troops. During a meeting with Nordic leaders, Ukraine's foreign minister confirmed media reports. We are talking about regular units of the armed forces of North Korea. 
which are going to participate on the side of Russia in its armed aggression against Ukraine. Pyongyang showing no interest in cooperating with the West anymore. Just this week, it broadcast thousands of students signing up for the army as it continues to talk of war. South Korea is accustomed to North Korean threats, and a key source of security is its alliance with the United States. But what would this alliance look like after the US election? If Vice President Harris becomes uh, president, she, she might want to try to negotiate with North Korea, but the North Koreans have rejected all these overtures and they've been uh, claiming that the only way for them to come back is to be recognized as a nuclear power state and for all sanctions to be relieved, which is not going to happen. A key concern is Donald Trump. After failing to get North Korea to give up its nuclear ambitions when he was last president, he now boasts of his relationship with North Korea leader Kim Jong-un. When we get back, I get along with him. He'd like to see me back, too. I think he misses me, if you want to know the truth. There's also the fear that Trump is going to th think to himself that North Korea is an issue that he left unfinished. Now, if he does, the fear is, will South Korea be part of the negotiations or will it be sidelined? He also demanded South Korea pay much more for the US troops stationed there, something he's continued to argue. It's time we stop. They're very, they're a money machine. Whenever he made these demands, the perception was that it's no longer an alliance, but rather a protection racket. South Korea and other allies are required for the interests of the United States. Whatever the outcome, uh, I'm hoping that the alliances will be much more appreciated. South Korea is in a pretty hostile neighborhood with North Korea, Russia and China just next door. So there's a lot riding on how Seoul can manage its relationship with whoever next enters the White House. Well, let's go to some more headlines now. The Japanese anti-nuclear group Nihon Hidankyo has been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for its efforts to achieve a world free of nuclear weapons. The group is a grassroots organisation for those who lived through the atomic bomb attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II. They say the world needs to learn more from the past. We will appeal to the world, as we always have done, for the abolishment of nuclear weapons and the achievement of an everlasting peace. An Australian-born K-pop star has made an emotional plea for better treatment of young artists in the multi-billion dollar industry. Hani, a member of the group New Jeans, testified before South Korea's parliament in a rare appearance by a major K-pop star to address bullying in the industry. For years, the industry has been dogged by complaints of high pressure and bullying, sparking calls for companies to better protect their artists. Macquarie University's Dr Sarah Keith says Honey's allegation could lead to political intervention. South Korea has been quite interested in recent years in enacting legislation to protect its K-pop idols and to protect the industry. So there were labor laws that were brought in a few years ago to ensure that particularly its uh, younger stars were treated well and fairly. And the outcome is likely to be uh, a refinement of the legislation about harassment and bullying. But uh, the problem is likely to be how this legislation can be actually enacted uh, in day-to-day -day management practices. There have been complaints ever, well, for the last few decades about mismanagement in the K-pop industry. What's new with uh, Hani's testimony and allegation is that she's specifically allegate, um, alleging that she is being bullied and mismanaged and harassed by her current management. Uh, this is all also part of a larger dispute between the group and their management. Um, but regardless of the, the context, it's interesting that a K-pop artist is going public during her career with these kinds of allegations. It's absolutely um, a subject of public fascination mm -hmm. and the amount of column inches, memes and speculation that have arisen over this case is unprecedented, I think, in, in K-pop. And it's really uh, shining quite, quite a light on the management practices in K-pop and I think has caused uh, a lot of problems for South Korea's largest entertainment company at the moment, HYBE. In Indonesia, a mother has been reunited with her 11-month-old baby after he was allegedly sold by her husband online. Indonesian police say a man has been charged after allegedly selling his own child on Facebook for nearly 1500 Australian dollars. According to police, the married couple who bought the baby had been trying to have a child for 10 years. 
The baby's mother has dropped legal action against them, but not her husband. Last year, the Indonesian Commission for Child Protection received 64 complaints related to child exploitation and trafficking. Pakistan's capital was put under lockdown and given a three-day public holiday during a visit from China's Premier Li Qiang. While there, Premier Li inaugurated a Beijing-funded airport with Pakistan's Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif. The leaders went on to meet with delegates from across Eurasia, including Russia, Iran and India, for the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Across two days of meetings, the group agreed to work together on a range of areas, including trade, transport and climate change. But just days before, at least 21 coal miners were killed in an attack in Baluchistan province, an area at the centre of China's Belt and Road Initiative in Pakistan. It's the most recent outbreak outbreak of violence in the region after a spate of attacks said to target foreign nationals. Well, to tell us more, reporter for ABC's Asia-Pacific newsroom, Libby Hogan, is with me in the studio. Hi, Libby. Hi. Can you tell us, Libby, what do these attacks have to do with China's Belt and Road Initiative? So the most recent attack in Karachi was claimed by the Baluch Liberation Army. Now they are a separatist movement, an armed separatist movement that have launched a decades long um, campaign against the government that they say basically is responsible for misappropriating, um, exploiting the natural resources in Baluchistan, which is in the south of Pakistan. Now, in the south of Pakistan is where China is basically investing for its jewel of the Belt and Road Initiative. China's building the economic corridor from landlocked Xinjiang in the north right down to the port in the south. And this is a really key strategic area as well as for economically and as well as politically. So the BLA, they have basically targeted only Chinese nationals connected with economic projects, but there's also been a string of attacks. Some haven't been claimed, claimed by the BLA. And what has been the thing that has been consistent, though, has been these statements that have been put out now and again by the BLA or by others that are saying, we don't want Chinese investment in Baluchistan. We want economic benefits of any projects from any energy from any of the energy projects back to the Baluchistan people. At the same time, you've got to understand where's all this coming from? Baluchistan is the poorest. Also, 42% of Pakistan is, is basically home to Baluchistan. So you've got a very um, sparsely populated population that doesn't have access to the basics, water, education, healthcare. They're now seeing this $65 billion project that China is investing in this economic corridor. And from the port, they're not seeing some of those benefits trickle down. So it's a very interesting kind of tinderbox at the moment of relations that we're seeing and heightened security threats. So it's all connected. You've got also the tension between India, Afghanistan, Iran. So it's a real hot area and it's an area of instability as well that's been carefully watched. Mm. Just how important is Pakistan to the Belt and Road Initiative of Beijing? So it is key. China, Xi Jinping has really invested billions here and he's determined to see it be successful. It is key for linking up for the port for trade, it's going to cut down that tra travel time. For Xinjiang, any goods coming through there. But it's also strategic. So we're looking at competition. We're looking at India in the region. We've got the two superpowers always trying to compete and have control. You've also got um, the Strait of Hormoz. You're going to compete with trade coming through there. But also, it avoids choke points like the Malacca Strait. So it's very important strategically, but also for trade and economically. It's also important for stability, and that's what is the increased tension and why we have seen this uh, recent conference this week. The top subject that was discussed was security for Chinese nationals on this project. Without stability, we're going to see more trouble for China to complete their economic corridor. There's benefits for Pakistan here. There's roads, there's increased services. But at the moment, the people aren't seeing that. There's been a lack of um, representation in a lot of the agreements. And it kind of adds to decades long resentment that the Baluch and other ethnic minorities in that region are feeling towards the government. This is a really unstable country. 
it's got the opportunity to be stable if you see all parties being involved and you're seeing proper trust and proper representation in some of those agreements. Libby, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. There are some shocking statistics around the violence faced by children in Cambodia, with more than half being severely beaten. But the country is on the brink of passing new legislation, which could, among other things, ban corporal punishment. And Buddhist monks are taking a leading role in teaching parents and grandparents just how damaging abuse can be. Southeast Asia correspondent Lauren Day reports from Siem Reap. Not far from the ancient ruins of Angkor Wat, these monks are learning some modern lessons. When people get angry with their children or grandchildren, they used to hit them physically or curse them verbally. But now we are teaching them the Dharma about non-violence. In this heavily Buddhist country, monks hold a special place in the community and a special responsibility. <laughs> It's very important. Buddhist monks play a major role in our nation and society. They're part of the Pagoda program, which has been delivered by UNICEF and the Ministry of Cults and Religions since 2018. We have been able to mobilise over 1,500 monks in five provinces, which means more than 500 pagodas, actually close to 600 pagodas, and we have reached about 8,000 people. Today, they're passing on what they've learnt to parents, grandparents and kids themselves. Children who suffer from violence, they become frightened. They don't perform well at school. They're panicked. They are not confident. My participation today helps me a lot. I will apply it to my family and society and will improve it further. The situation is still pretty dire for kids here in Cambodia. More than half have been physically assaulted and emotional and sexual abuse are also all too common. And that's not to mention child trafficking, child labour or child marriage, which are still big problems here. Advocates hope that could soon be about to change, with the country on the brink of passing its first ever child protection laws. In order to improve the lives of our children, we have to make this law to protect their four rights, namely the right to survival, the right to protection, the right to development and the right to participation. If it's put in place, it'll be the first country in the whole of Asia to have such a, a piece of law. It's hoped the new legislation will be endorsed by the Council of Ministers by the end of the year. Lauren Day, ABC News, Siem Reap. And that's the program. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.